Hey, no intro. Here we go. I don't like words that hide the truth. I don't like words that conceal reality. I don't like euphemisms or euphemistic language. And American English is loaded with euphemisms because Americans sure. have a lot of trouble dealing with reality. Americans have trouble facing the truth. So they invent the kind of a soft language to protect themselves from it. And it gets worse with every generation. For some reason, it just keeps getting worse. I'll give you an example of that. There's a condition in combat most people know about it. It's when a fighting person's nervous system has been stressed to its absolute peak and maximum, can't take any more input. The nervous system has either snapped or is about to snap. In the First World War, that condition was called shell shock. Simple, honest, direct language. Two syllables, shell shock. Almost sounds like the guns themselves. That was 70 years ago. Then a whole generation went by and the Second World War came along and we, the very same combat condition was called battle fatigue. Four syllables now, takes a little longer to say, doesn't seem to hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Shell shock. Battle fatigue. <laughs> then we had the war in Korea, 1950. Madison Avenue was riding high by that time and the very same combat condition was called operational exhaustion. <laughs> hey, we're up to eight syllables now. And the humanity has been squeezed completely out of the phrase. It's totally sterile now. Operational exhaustion. Sounds like something that might happen to your car. <laughs> then, of course, came the war in Vietnam, which has only been over for about 16 or 17 years. And thanks to the lies and deceit surrounding that war, I guess it's no surprise that the very same condition was called post-traumatic stress disorder. Still eight syllables, but we've added a hyphen. And the pain is completely buried under jargon. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I'll bet you if we'd have still been calling it shell shock, some of those Vietnam veterans might have gotten the attention they needed at the time. I'll bet you that. I'll bet you that. I did not know the origins of post-traumatic stress disorder. That was educational. Now, I think most people use the acronym PTSD and it became even more dehumanizing. A lot of people don't even know what that stands for. But, but it didn't happen. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons is because we were using that soft language, that language that takes the life out of life. And it is a function of time. It does keep getting worse. I'll give you another example. Sometime during my life, sometime during my life, toilet paper became bathroom tissue. I wasn't notified <laughs> I still of call this. it toilet paper. No one asked me if I agreed with it. It just happened. Toilet paper became bathroom tissue. Sneakers became running shoes. False teeth became dental appliances. Medicine became medication. Information became directory assistance. The dump became the landfill. Car crashes became automobile accidents. Partly cloudy became partly sunny. Motels became motor lodges. House trailers became mobile homes. Used cars became previously owned transportation. <laughs> room service became guest room dining. And constipation became occasional irregularity. <laughs> when I was a little kid, if I got sick, they wanted me to go to the hospital and see the doctor. Now they want me to go to a health maintenance organization or a wellness center to consult a health care delivery professional. Poor people used to live in slums. Now the economically disadvantaged occupy substandard housing in the inner cities. <laughs> so and true. they're broke. They're broke. They don't have a negative cash flow position. They're fucking broke. Because <laughs> a lot of them were fired. You know, fired, management wanted to curtail redundancies in the human resources area. So many people are no longer viable members of the workforce. Smug, greedy, well-fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore. They neutralize people. Or they depopulate the area. 
The government doesn't lie and engages in disinformation. The Pentagon actually measures nuclear radiation in something they call sunshine units. Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? They never mention that part of it to us, do they? No, they, they don't. <laughs> And some of this stuff is just silly, we know, we all know that. Like on the airlines, they say they want a pre-board. Well, what the hell is pre-board? What does that mean? To get on before you get on? <laughs> they say they're going to pre-board those passengers in need of special assistance. Cripples! <laughs> Simple, honest, direct language. There's no shame attached to the word cripple that I can find in any dictionary. No shame attached to it. In fact, it's a word used in Bible translations. Jesus healed the cripples. Doesn't take seven words to describe that condition. But we don't have any cripples in this country anymore. We have the physically challenged. Is that a grotesque enough evasion for you? How about differently abled? I've heard them call that differently abled. You can't even call these people handicapped anymore. They'll say, we're not handicapped, we're handy capable. <laughs> these poor people have been bullshitted by the system into believing that if you change the name of the condition, somehow you'll change the condition. Well, hey, cousin, <laughs> doesn't happen. <laughs> doesn't happen. Changes nothing. We have no more deaf people in this country, hearing impaired. No one's blind anymore, partially sighted or visually impaired. We have no more stupid people. Everybody has a learning disorder. <laughs> or he's minimally exceptional. How would you like to be told that about your child? He's minimally exceptional. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> Psychologists actually have started calling ugly people those with severe appearance deficits. I'd rather it's getting be so bad that any day now I expect to hear a rape victim referred to as an unwilling sperm recipient. <laughs> and we have no more old people in this country. No more old people. We shipped them all away and we brought in these senior citizens. <laughs> Isn't that a typically American 20th century <laughs> phrase? Bloodless, lifeless. No pulse in one of them. A senior citizen. But I've accepted that one. I've come to terms with it. I know it's here to stay. We'll never get rid of it. That's what they're going to be called. So I'll relax on that. But the one I do resist, the one I keep resisting, is when they look at an old guy and they'll say, Look at him, Dan. He's 90 years young. Imagine the fear of aging that reveals. To not even be able to use the word old to describe someone. To have to use an antonym. And fear of aging is natural. It's universal, isn't it? We all have that. No one wants to get old. No one wants to die. But we do. So we bullshit ourselves. <laughs> I started bullshitting myself when I got to my 40s. As soon as I was in my 40s, I'd look in the mirror and I'd say, Well, I, I guess I'm getting older. Older sounds a little better than old, doesn't it? Sounds like it might even last a little longer. <laughs> Bullshit, I'm getting old. And it's okay, because thanks to our fear of death in this country, I won't have to die. I'll pass away. <laughs> Or I'll expire like a magazine subscription. <laughs> if it happens in the hospital, they'll call it a terminal episode. The insurance company will refer to it as negative patient care outcome. And if it's the result of malpractice, they'll say it was a therapeutic misadventure. I'm telling you, some of this language makes me want to vomit. Well, maybe not vomit. Makes me want to engage in an involuntary personal protein spill. <laughs> I'm pretty new to watching comedy, but I do like this subset of it for sure. It wasn't exactly telling jokes as explaining a phenomenon in a clever way, which in turn is funny. It was thoughtful, it was philosophical, 
and it led the listener to some sort of introspection without being forceful. What? Just me? Okay. It led me to realize that I do use euphemisms without even thinking about it. I'm not sick, I'm under the weather. And he's not obese, or fat, he's overweight. I like languages in general, but English specifically has that depth. The romance languages, or at least the ones that I know well enough to say, have beautiful words, but turn of phrases and understanding that jargon is what makes English so complex for non-English speakers. If you learned English as a second language or you're close with someone who has, you'll have to let me know what you think about that down below. The existence of euphemisms or using them from time to time isn't the problem, but I think it is a problem when we dictate the language of others and then enforce that because then we're just living in a society that uses new speak and that should be left for Orwellian novels, not real life. Speaking of Orwell, while George Carlin was explaining the evolution of shell shock to post-traumatic stress disorder, it brought the quote to my mind, whoever controls language controls culture, which is a theme explored in his book 1984. And in that book, there's a character called Syme, who was a government linguist, and he explains Newspeak to have an aim of quote, narrow the range of thought in order to eradicate thought crime by making it so that there were no words to explain things that people weren't allowed to think. Because in that dystopian society, they weren't allowed to articulate concepts such as self-expression or personal identity or free will. They had to put all of their newspeak words into newspeak dictionaries, which were changed every so often as what was accepted in society changed. And there are some words that if you look at their definitions now, they're not the same as they were 10 years ago, even five years ago. And that's all relatable to what George Carlin explains has happened throughout the course of his lifetime. Some of the changes were innocuous and some have really negative effects. I'm sure, I have gone over in another video how I think generations have gotten softer over time. And that manifests itself in participation trophies and getting easily offended. I know I've already recommended 1984 on the channel. So for today's literary moment, if you haven't read Wittgenstein's Tractatus and Philosophical Investigations, I recommend it. It's a longer one though. It explores how language is used in language games by trying to distinguish a correlation between language and the world. Sense and nonsense. And I think George Carlin presented a bit of both. Sense in breaking down how language can be used as nonsense. Does that make sense? I will drop the book title in the bio below for you. I don't know if there's a free audiobook version. I'll look for it. And if there is, I'll put it down there as well. Anyway, tell me your top euphemism. Either the one that you use the most or the one that you think is most nonsensical. And for today, that's all I've got. Thanks for watching with me.